Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. This is Katie Rowley. I am an outreach and reference librarian for the NOAA Central Library, and we are very excited to be welcoming back today David Goodrich. So, uh, David Goodrich worked for NOAA's Climate Program Office in Silver Spring and retired as the Director of Climate Observations. He also served as the Director of the UN Global Climate Observing System in Geneva, Switzerland. In addition to the bicycle trip from Alberta to North Dakota, he has ridden from Delaware to Oregon, down the Appalachians and across Montana, South Dakota, France, and Spain. His earlier book, which he presented uh, to the library a couple of years ago, was A Hole in the Wind, A Climate Scientist's Bicycle Journey Across the United States. He lives in Maryland, and we are very excited that he joined us today virtually for this presentation of his new book, A Voyage Across an Ancient Ocean, A Bicycle Journey Through the Northern Domain dominion of oil. And with that, um, I want to let everyone know some logistics. If you are having trouble with your audio or your visuals, try logging off and logging back in to GoToWebinar. That usually solves most issues. We will also be accepting questions, but if you put them in the question panel, we're going to hold them until the end of the presentation. Okay, take it away. It's very neat to, uh, to be back with uh, all of my NOAA friends virtually. Um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, uh, a lot of old friends on the um, as attendees on these, and I'm very flattered that uh, uh, that you came on. The uh, the occasion here, I, I just uh, released the book with this. Uh, this is the cover of the book called "A Voyage Across an Ancient Ocean." Um, the title refers to a ride from the. Uh, from the uh, oil sands region of Alberta, near the town of Fort McMurray, down across uh, through the boreal forest and the, um, the boreal forest and the plains to Williston, North Dakota, which is where the Bakken oil field is. So it sort of have match, matching pairs uh, oil fields across the US. And I happen to be riding across the area where um, once upon a time, uh, several uh, hundred million years ago, the center of North America was a shallow sea, and that shallow sea gave rise to both oil deposits, um, both the Bakken and the Alberta oil sands. I want to uh, flip quickly to a picture and a, uh, a reminiscence. Um, as, uh, as Katie just mentioned, uh, I did ride across the country, and it, this was right after I retired from NOAA in, in uh, 2011. And this is the the, the full cross country rig from uh, where I was where I was riding, and I put that on with a specific purpose of the the Boulder people in mind. The uh, when I rode across in 2011, the uh, I was coming into Boulder for a Friday afternoon seminar. And uh, I was just barely able to ma make it. I, I needed a wind change coming across Kansas for me to make it there on time. I just barely made it. Uh, I was about an hour ahead of the seminar time rolling into the NOAA labs, uh, the NOAA Boulder labs. And uh, Jeannie Waters, who I noticed is on the call, car, uh, the call here, was, um, Let's say you know I've been, I'd been on the road for about 2,000 miles, and let's say uh, Jeannie was practicing social distancing before it was a thing. So she sort of gently directed me to the showers, um, and then um, I had the seminar. was was great fun. Uh, great to see a lot of the people there. But at the end of the seminar, this is Boulder, and there are all kinds of equipment geeks in Boulder, and um, after the talk, everyone is clustered around the bike. It's like I'm over here, but you know, hey, I'm over here, people. Um, but the 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 Boulder people wanted to see what the equipment was. Oh, you know, what kind of gear ratio you're running? You know, what you know, uh, what are you hooked up with? So I figured I'd get this out of the way for the Boulder folks first. This is this is the uh, the cross country rig. Um, I had panniers front and rear and a tent in back when I was riding across. Uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, North Dakota, I got rid of those two front panniers 
and uh, also got rid of the camping gear. They said, at first I was thinking, well, maybe I should have brought the camping gear since I'm riding through the boreal forest. But a guy later said, and I, I said, you know, I know about hanging food for bears. And the, the guy up there said, you know, I'm, I'm not so, wouldn't be so worried about bears. It's, it's the wolves. It's like, oh yeah, uh, real live wolves. So I was, it's like there's this qualitative difference between hanging food and being food. So, uh, so anyway, this was what, uh, uh, what the rig looked like riding across. Um, and I'll show you where that was. Um, this is the, the two, these are some rides since 2011, since I've retired from NOAA. I've, I've done a lot of long, uh, long rides. This uh, blue ride is the, the Trans Am, the ride across the US from Delaware to Oregon. The uh, boulder is right about where I started turning to the, to the Northwest. Uh, there's some other miscellaneous rides, but the one I want to talk about today is going from uh, Fort McMurray in Alberta, which is about the same latitude as central Hudson's Bay, and down through the forest across the prairie in Saskatchewan, down to uh, the Bakken, and at the end to Theodore Roosevelt National Park. So the benefits of a Mercator projection is that this looks a lot longer than it was. It was still about 1,100 miles, but it was a um, was a longish ride. So more specifically, to uh, look particularly at the um, the ride in question today, um, this is a little better look. Fort McMurray and the area around Fort McMurray um, are where the oil sands, the tar sands are. If you go to Google Maps, if you flip over to Google Maps satellite view, you can see the mines very clearly. They are some of the, uh, the they are some of the larger larger man-made structures on the on the planet. Um, so I rode down through the forest, um, broke out of the forest right about here, and then down through the plains of Saskatchewan into North Dakota. It ended at the town of Dickinson, North Dakota. So this was this was the uh, the ancient ocean, as it were. Uh, at the start of the ride at Fort McMurray, there was this really intimidating sign at the edge of town: um, "No gas or services next 200 miles." I had this very distinct sinking feeling when I rode past this sign. It's like I better have everything together right here because uh, I. I would stay actually at a couple of the what they call the man camps, more more properly lodges, but these are encampments for oil field workers that you know take up you know also take on any sort of riffraff that's along the way. The uh, but before before getting on the road here, a couple of pictures. I, I chartered an airplane out of the airport at Fort McMurray to get a look at what. Uh, the, the oil sands, the tar sands uh, look like. I'll refer to them as the oil sands just because when you're in Canada, if you meant, if you say the tar sands, you'll sort of get corrected in this gentle Canadian way. Um, this is a photograph of the mining operations in the, in the oil sands. These look like um, kind of little tiny, you know, stream of ants heading to and from the where the oil sands are being dug, but these are actually some of the largest vehicles in the world. Um, these dump trucks um, were described to me as driving your house out of the upstairs bathroom window uh, by a guy who drove one. And what they do here is they're digging up sands that have uh, oil locked in them, and with a combination of chemicals and hot water boil the uh, the tar, more properly bitumen, out of the oil sands uh, and get it to, to a place where it can flow in a pipeline south. This is the source region for the Keystone XL pipeline, which was another of the reasons I was interested in this place. Um, it is some of the uh, 
dirtiest oil in the sense that it takes the most energy and generates the most carbon dioxide of any oil in the world to, pr to produce. I mean, think about how much energy it takes to melt tar um, in a 40 degree, 40 degree below zero temperature in the, uh, um, in the nearly in the Canadian Arctic. The, the river that flows through town, we're actually in the drainage basin of the Arctic Ocean. Um, in order to um, get the oil out, it requires a tremendous amount of heated water, and that water is, uh, the, oil, the oil needs to settle out of the water, and that actually takes years. So you have these giant tailings ponds, and I put the ponds in quotes because, again, these are, these are vast structures. This one looks kind of like a, uh, a latte. Um, this is again from the from the air. Um, to give you a scale, this is probably about this is probably about a two mile tailings pond that we flew over at the time. Now, um, another reason that you may have heard of Fort McMurray is that it was the site of the largest uh, insured natural disaster in Canadian history, 2016. I was not there in 2016, but this is what it looked like. The, um, there was a fire that uh, blew up in the, uh, in the forest north of Fort McMurray, and they, the locals just referred to it as the beast. Uh, it came very close to burning out the entire town. This Here you can see um, at nightfall on the 4th of May 2016, where it's developing these pyrocumulonimbus. These are um, literally firestorm clouds that generate their own, uh, their own lightning. The, they were able to evacuate Fort McMurray, 80,000 people, with uh, basically only two people losing their life. That was in a traffic accident. But the videos of the, the escape from Fort McMurray are pretty eye-opening. Now, the fire, uh, happened because it was a very, um, it was very dry, very hot around Fort McMurray that early in the season. And this is one of the manifestations of climate change. We are having more and bigger fires, witness the current fires in California. This one in, uh, in Fort McMurray just barely, um, with the efforts of um, about a hundred aircraft, they managed to keep it out of the center city, but there were still um, vast tracts of homes that were burned out. The, and one can rightly question is, did Fort McMurray's business have something to do with Fort McMurray's tragedy? I think that you can make a pretty good case that it did. Uh, so uh, I rode south through a couple of pictures of, uh, uh, the ride through the prairies. Uh, I stopped at one town in Saskatchewan called Keniston, and the the local pro hockey team in Keniston is um, the Keniston Blizzards. Keniston used to be known as the Blizzard capital of Canada. Um, it's not quite that way anymore. Um, this was a 90 degree day where there were uh, a couple of teenagers looking for shade in the shadow of the Keniston snowman. I've been, I've been watching a lot of Frozen lately with my, grand, with my grandkids and, uh, you know, what do the, what do snowmen do in summer? Well, this is it. Uh, also had some interesting accommodations along the way. As I was going south, headed for the border in North Dakota, there was only one place to stay for about 130 miles, and this was it. Um, this was pretty amazing. This is in Fortuna, North Dakota. Um, it was about, uh, this is uh, about 10 miles south of the, of the U.S.-Canadian border, and, you know, you, you ride up on it, and you think, oh, okay, this is, an, this is an elementary school, and then you notice the beer ads on the side, and the big sign for the teacher's lounge, the, the official name of the place, as you might guess, this is an 
uh, an old retired elementary school. Um, and the bar, of course, is known as the teacher's lounge. Uh, I, uh, I stayed here overnight and they had broken the classrooms into sort of little lodging, but they still had a touch. The, the showers were outdoors, or sorry, sorry, were out of the room. And there's a little sign. Uh, they had kept the boys sign on the, the bathroom slash showers. So it was, uh, uh, it was, it was a little interesting. So I, I uh, rode the next day into uh, the approach to Williston, North Dakota, and uh, it was a super hot day. It was upper 90s, and the approach to Williston, after being really out in the prairie for a long time, it's a it's a busy place. It's an oil town, and you see on the horizon. Um, uh, a bunch of oil well flares. The, the, this is the Bakken field. This is one of the major areas of uh, where hydraulic fracturing is being used in the, in the country. It's one of the pioneer areas. And uh, there is a lot of methane, it's, which is uh, generated as part of the fracking process. Um, it is not necessarily economical to connect pipelines to these uh, to these wells so it either gets burned off or released it, you can see pictures of the oil well flares from uh, from the Bakken and, and it's an area that's much bigger than Chicago and you can see it at night the nighttime satellite shots are fairly dramatic uh, at the South side of the Bakken field is uh, a rather special place. There is Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Uh, it, it is the place where Teddy was a cowboy back in the 1880s. I remember, but I, I dug up this picture. It's actually from the Library of Congress um, of our future president in, uh, in tailored buckskins. As he's about to go out west to become a to become a rancher, and I remember looking at this picture and thinking, the real cowboys are going to eat this New York dude alive. And in fact, what happened was just the opposite. Teddy Roosevelt had more energy than than any three human beings. Um, he was. Uh, uh, it, they actually actually chased some outlaws that stole his boat um, three days through the winter and then um, got the drop on them and marched them 40 miles to a jail in Dickinson, North, uh, North Dakota. This is in the middle of the snow. And while he was doing this camp, this camp trip, he was uh, he was reading Anna Karenina. So it's a pretty formidable guy. And it also struck me that the uh, that one of the uh, Teddy Roosevelt is justly known as as our conservation president, the father of uh, of conservation, and many of what he was thinking about um, happened in while he was in his cowboy days in North Dakota. He went west to to hunt the buffalo and discovered that there weren't very many buffalo left at all. Um, Teddy Roosevelt's presidency, he found himself as the trust buster. The, the big monopolies that dominated the economy, um, Standard Oil, uh, J.P. Morgan's Northern Securities, were the, the people that Teddy Roosevelt was doing battle with. And what that has to do with today is that the same companies that are the biggest uh, producers of oil and gas and the biggest financiers of oil and gas are derivatives of the same companies that Teddy Roosevelt fought. He uh, was responsible for pushing the breakup of John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil. Uh, that didn't happen actually till 1912, but he, he was in the middle of that battle. Standard Oil broke up. Uh, two of the major components were Standard Oil of New Jersey, which became Exxon, 
and Standard Oil of New York, which became Mobil, which became Exxon Mobil. Then um, his big fight in the financiers, Northern Securities, was uh, against J.P. Morgan, the biggest uh, financier of oil and gas exploration, is um, J.P. Morgan Chase. So it's almost like the people that Teddy, uh, the companies that Teddy broke up, have um, are back again. Uh, this is a photograph. Um, this is the northern part, a Google Maps image of the northern part of uh, Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Elkhorn Ranch was where, uh, was Teddy's ranch. It's now just foundations and ruins, but it's a little, little tiny piece of the national park. And what you can see from Google Maps images, there are these telltale little, uh, little pat little uh, orange patches those are drill pads there 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 um all down in here and um all within two miles of elkhorn ranch and for me metaphorically it was it's as though teddy is surrounded um that these days there is so much drilling going on around the national park and specifically around the place that arguably is the birthplace of of conservation uh, that uh, Teddy might be rubbing his chin here. Um, I wanted to close and also leave uh, time for people's questions. The, uh, I just wanted to show a couple of pictures and spend uh, less time uh, less time in, in seminar mode and more in question and answer mode. The, uh, but one last uh, photograph, when I, when I worked uh, at NOAA, the climate office, uh, early on, one of my first, uh, first times was going to uh, the American Geophysical Union conference. And I remember just sort of hearing, uh, rumors and mutterings as I was going past people in the hall about, oh, I wonder what Wally thinks. I wonder what, is, is Wally, is Wally talking today? It's like, I kept hearing this name Wally and I, uh, uh, and after a couple of minutes, I saw this, you know, red and gray haired guy, cherubic looking guy with just a name, play, name tag that said Wally. And Wally was Wallace Broker, who was, um, uh, spent his career at Lamont Dory, now Lamont Dory Earth, Earth Observatory, and um, had a way about him that um, he, was, he was one of the giants in geochemistry. He um, originally wrote a paper in 1975 that said, uh, climate change, are we on the cusp of a, of a global warming? And that was, really the popularization of the phrase global warming. Um, and he said that uh, basically um, at the pace we're going on CO2 emissions, we're going to be off the stops by uh, the year 2000. We will be outside of the realm of human experience. And um, he pretty much had, he pretty much nailed it back then. He would argue for that he was right for some of the wrong reasons, but he would, uh, broker um, had this intuitive grasp of how the planet works. He was, he was almost like a uh, childlike in two senses. I had the unfortunate experience of um, dealing with broker in a, you know, grown up um, uh, budgets and uh, grants kind of discussion, which was very unpleasant. I think he threw a pencil at least once. Um, so he wasn't very good at those kind of things, but he also had this childlike way. I mean, I've been hanging out with my my grandson lately. My grandson likes to to take toys from different parts of the um, of the toy chest and put them together in very strange ways. And Broker did that with uh, theories of how the Earth works um, and came up with some very different uh, kinds of things. So I want to close actually with a. Uh, a quote that I was always thinking of from, from Broker. Um, this was a drilling platform 
on the approach to Williston, North Dakota in the Bakken. And with a quote from, from Wally Broker, uh, I don't know if he would, would still, if uh, he, he passed away last year, uh, but one of his more famous quotes, quotes is, climate is an angry beast and we are poking at it with sticks. And uh, I look at the sticks uh, in the Bakken and feel like uh, we're right there. So uh, I'll leave it at that. And uh, perhaps we can, can take some questions. Just uh, by the way, the, the book is available on Amazon or better still, if you want to support your local bookshop, there is a, uh, a site called uh, bookshop.org where you can uh, devote some of the, the profits to whomever your local bookstore is if, you, if you're interested in it. But uh, uh, Katie, perhaps she could uh, could help now, and and I can maybe I can answer some questions. Yes, of course. So if anyone has a question, uh, please place that in your question panel. If you have a personal comment, I uh, put those there as well, and you can I will pass those on after the presentation to Dave. Uh, so our first question is. Um, about the future of energy. Uh, while many projects suggest the demise of the big oil and gas companies, I'm curious about your thoughts of a hydrogen economy. Since 95% of all hydrogen is produced from natural gas, one might imagine a life after oil for ExxonMobil, Chevron, et cetera. Um, I would say there's, there's uh, first of all, uh, oil and gas is not necessarily my, uh, my field. So the uh, whether a hydrogen economy um, is going to work or can work is uh, yeah, I, I I don't have a good idea for that one. But um, I suspect that the oil companies are still going to be around, but they may just be moving into other areas of energy. What you've seen in BP, in the last few weeks is BP getting more and more invested in, um, in renewable energy, in, in um, non-petroleum non energy. We, one can justifiably be a little bit skeptical because once upon a time, uh, BP uh, advertised itself as beyond petroleum, but um, these are big, powerful companies and they also know how energy systems work. So there's, I think there's a place for them, but I always see the, um, I hesitate to call it the solution to the climate problem, but the approach to the climate problem is gradually, is sort of turning this ship, uh, I use ship analogies a lot because I used to uh, drive ships for NOAA, that turning the ship um, away from uh, things that emit greenhouse gases and away from fossil fuels. I'm not sure how you necessarily produce hydrogen without um, also producing CO2 or having a disposal problem with CO2. Great, thank you. Okay, our next question. Um, thank you for sharing your adventure with us. Did you encounter residents with concerns about climate change on this trip? Um, I had the chance when I was in uh, when I was in Fort McMurray, there was a uh, a gentleman who was uh, was a power engineer for one of the companies in Fort McMurray, um, and he knew what I would you know he knew my project, and he took me for a ride around the oil fields, and I think. The point he was trying to make is, um, you know, we're we're kind of people trying to make a living up here too. He said, if if you wanted something to tell the people, to, you know, tell folks we're not, you know, we're not bad people up here. We're trying to do this in a more uh, in a more efficient way. Uh, I, for me, I don't know how you uh, dig tar out of the ground and melted in 40 below without being amazingly energy intensive. Um, and, but what I did find in uh, talking with people about climate change, especially in, in North Dakota, 
that uh, it was something where the, the, the subject got changed very quickly. Um, and the way the subject got changed is, um, well, climate's always changed. It's like, well, yes, that's true, but we, we are very arguably outside, uh, uh, outside the norms where we've been in for, um, for a very long time. And so there was that side, that side of things that was almost like a, a deflection. I talked to a guy who was a water manager in North Dakota. North, North Dakota is a pretty conservative place. And it was, again, they could see climate changing. They could see the effects of climate changing. Um, but to use those words was, uh, was rather difficult. The, you know, climate change is, oh, that's all about politics. If you talk about, okay, um, what do you see? Um, are you seeing different animals? Um, are you seeing, uh, are the plants in your garden um, still able to grow? Are you having to, to replant different things? Well, that was, you know, that's, that was almost fair game. So, but I still feel like from, uh, you know, even looking at the, the most conservative parts of the country, uh, you still see driving across Wyoming, driving across uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, you see amazing numbers of wind turbines up. Uh, wind energy is growing in the central U.S. like crazy. Wyoming has a, an oil and gas economy, except um, right along that windiest part of the country on, on along the I-80 corridor, there are wind turbines going up all over the place. Uh, so uh, I think because whether or not people acknowledge climate change as an issue, there's a, there are a lot of people that are willing to be part of that solution. Great, thank you. Our next question, uh, did you get any behind the scenes looks at either the oil sands mining and production activities or the Bakken fracking uh, operations? And did you have any impressions on those? Um, I did get, uh, I did not so much in the Bakken. I mean, the, uh, you actually, in a pad, I, I rode by many of the, the drill pads and what you, you see is, you know, what's in this picture that I just showed you. You, you have a, uh, a drilling derrick, you have typically tanks that those are, uh, the tanks you see over here on the left um, typically will hold either uh, solutions for, for drilling. Um, there are some fairly proprietary and exotic mixtures of stuff they shoot down into the ground, but they also have to have tanks for um, brine that comes back up. And I remember reading in one of the articles um, about a woman kind of leaning over one of the brine tanks and that you could smell the salt water that came back up from an ocean that was here 400 million years ago. Um, that's, you know, it really is the ancient ocean. Although these, these brine tanks are, are um, some amazingly toxic stuff. Um, not only is it uh, salt water, but you have uh, uh, the, uh, dissolved oil, you have the, the various surfactants, biocides, things they use to keep uh, bacteria from growing, uh, and things they use to sort of keep the, the fractured cracks open. So the, the brine disposal is a big issue down there. So that's that's regarding the Bakken. Um, in the Alberta oil sands, the uh, the guy who took me around, I, I call him Brian in the book, I, the mostly because he tells stories on uh, uh, on Exxon Mobil, it's, it's, it's kind of sniffing about all the the big time smart oil guys uh, coming up from Houston and uh, not exactly knowing how to deal with 40 below winters. Uh, but um, he took me around the oil sands region, and a couple of things stuck in my stuck in my mind. One, in these giant tailings ponds, uh, it was it was like another planet. Because next to the tailings ponds, 
they're very concerned about uh, about birds landing in these ponds. The, they have uh, sound cannons going off, propane driven. You you just hear this boom, boom, boom going all the time. And they have uh, silhouettes of raptors on stuck up on posts to try and scare birds away. Um, a, a scarecrow for birds, if you will. And uh, what happened once, um, I guess it was about 10 years ago, was they had a failure in the sound cannons during migration season. And there was a flock of about 2,000 ducks that went into the tailings pond and none came out. Um, lots, of, lots of lumps on the surface of the ponds, uh, but the uh, was something of a disaster. So um, that was part of it. They also have made some effort to reclaim part um, old oil sands mines. They actually have a uh, one area that's a forest and one area where uh, they have uh, a wood bu wood buffalo herd. Except when you see it from the air, you realize that this, these reclaimed lands are a very small percentage of the actual active mining that's going on. And I, I tended to think of that, and, and all of, of course, all of these uh, reclaimed forests are right by the road that you drive by. And I was thinking, okay, this is like, like a Potemkin forest that um, you need to have, you know, forests that you can show people that it isn't this complete, uh, this complete wasteland, but you look, look at it from the air and it looks a lot more like a, a wasteland. So anyway, that's a couple of um, of things that I saw from the uh, from on the ground in uh, in the oil sands in the Bakken. Thank you. Um, we have a few more questions about um, how long did it take you to prep for the ride? What contingencies did you have to make? Were there any safety issues on your route? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, it, this. Uh, this ride was kind of out there. I, I, I really tried to get uh, some of my friends to go along and, um, you know, they were trying to gently let me down. It's like, well, you know, there's not too much in the way of good wine up there. I said, well, you know, they probably have some, have some good beers. Like, would you drink beer coming from the, from the oil sands? It's like, okay, I, I get it. Um, there were, uh, the safety issues for me were, more in the northern part going through the boreal forest that plate that sign where it says no services next 200 kilometers um i was i really with the rig that i had i needed to have a roof over my head uh each night and i could uh you know push comes to shove i can you know i could curl up in a ditch alongside the road but probably not very pleasant and you know, that there were real live wolves around. Um, and so I needed to make it from point A to point B, um, as in, you know, from this man camp to this man camp, and don't, you know, halfway doesn't do it. Uh, I had one day where I set out and uh, I was in 40 degree horizontal rain and, and, uh, and a headwind, uh, headwind, and I got 10 miles out, and I was thinking, okay, I could be in hypothermia land here uh, real quickly, and I still had 60, 60 miles to go, and I actually had to turn back um, and call it a day, which turned out to be a very good decision. So, um, because I would have been in a position that um, I would have hoped a pickup truck would come along. Uh, sooner or later that would help me out. I did have a time in uh, there's some there's some big storms out on the uh, in the forest, and I remember once where I thought I was being smart and, and just outrunning the storm, and I started hearing crackling over my head, and I it's like okay time to stop and get away from the bike since that's the the highest metal thing around and i just 
you know, did what I do is to sort of you ball up on the side of the road and get soaked. And I was, uh, I could, you know, it was raining pretty hard and then it turned to hail. It's like, okay, now I know why I'm wearing a helmet. Um, and I could see the, the hail starting to accumulate in the folds of my pants. And then I hear this crunching of gravel and a, uh, a woman in an SUV has pulled over rolls down the, she rolls down the window and says would you like a place out of the rain and i said well, you know i'm pretty wet she said oh, come on in she had three kids in the car and sort of sent them to the back seat and uh basically let me let me wait out the hailstorm there and then finally you know when it's starting to clear off it wasn't all that long but it was like she was looking for something to give me and she gave me what you would expect from a mom. She she had she had a juice box, and and I remember that night. I still had forty miles to ride, but it's like um, in the motel room. This was the magic juice box. It's like this actually happened. I can't believe it. Um, but somebody stopped for me in the middle of nowhere in the in a storm. So it was that was kind of neat. Um, the out on the prairie. You, you still had long distances to make point to point. And once uh, in this approach to Williston, uh, I did run out of water. It was like a 95 degree day. Uh, the people at the, at the teacher's lounge were saying, you know, well, you know, Melbourne might be open today, but otherwise you got 70 miles to, to Williston. And it turned out that Melbourne wasn't open. And I started with uh, five bottles of water and it was not enough. I mean, I was pouring water down my throat and I ended up in this town by the name of Bone Trail um, uh, on the final approaches to, to Williston. And when I finally got into Williston, I, I pulled into a fast food joint and you know, walked into the air conditioning and almost passed out, but ordered a Coke and went back to the you know, went back to the soda machine like five times um, as I was sort of getting myself uh, reassembled. So those were those were some of the uh, uh, some some of the times uh, road stories, if you will. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> That's those are very interesting. I'm just going to comment because I'm familiar with these uh, mosquitoes. Did you run into the many of those? <laughs> um, well, yeah. Uh, I flew into Fort McMurray. Um, it was actually after midnight in June, and Fort McMurray is is far enough north. It's not uh, past the Arctic Circle or anything, but it still never gets dark in uh, in mid June. So uh, I'm in the twilight after midnight. They swear to me, I'm standing at, out of this remote taxi stand. It's like I know this guy's going to be around sooner or later. But uh, it's like I've got all my gear, you know, boxed up and everything, and I'm standing there at the stand, and I needed more than two hands for the mosquitoes that came out. It was just wow, <laughs> this is welcome to the boreal forest. But uh, I did have a a uh, a stretch on that first day where I was. Uh, I was starting out, and uh, I had my I had my own personal cloud, and and not of the cyber variety. Uh, horse flies, they they have a lot of those, and they not only can get through, uh, not only would go after every exposed piece of skin, but you know the cycling stuff and spandex is pretty thin. They were the overachievers were getting through the uh, getting through my jersey as well, and I was just saying, um, if I could just have a time. You know, I would do anything to get rid of these horse flies. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's like there is a God and she has a wicked sense of humor because she all of a sudden this 30 mile an hour wind comes up right in my face. It's like, OK, I, 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 uh, be careful of what you wish for. <laughs> Thank you. OK, we're going to switch back to a few more serious questions. Uh, First question, uh, thank you for the talk. As we are looking at people being very strained by the lack of employment opportunities, 
what impact will that have on these oil sands? And what about your thoughts on the Tongass National Forest? Will it be the next big victim? Um, the the Tongass is a tough one. There, I'll do the last part first. And and I don't, um, I have never been to the Tongass. I read of it as one of the few pieces of uh, of virgin forest that uh, that's left. The uh, that would be uh, large scale logging in the Tongass. I think would just be a disaster. Um, the uh, and you kind of hope it doesn't happen. In terms of employment, the uh, the oil and gas industry, for one thing, is very much used to boom and busts. I mean, right now we are in, regardless of uh, climate or no climate, we are in a bust in the oil patch. The uh, uh, oil prices have dropped low enough that I think it might be just barely profitable to frack in the uh, in the Bakken. They will keep on doing it because they've already got such sunk costs. But in order to keep production going in an area like in a uh, a fracked oil field like the Bakken, you have to keep drilling. And a lot of wells are being uh, are being capped right now. It's actually not uh, not an e easy process to get a well restarted once you've drilled it. So, um, but in terms of the employment, um, indeed, oil and gas has been a boom and bust. During the Great Recession in 27, 20, uh, 2008, the best employment, the, the highest employment numbers in the U.S. were in North Dakota. The the uh, the Bakken field was uh, was roaring. That's not the case now because they're in some ways have been a victim of their own success, both in the Bakken and in the the Permian Basin in Texas, New Mexico. These are these are two of the biggest oil fields in the U.S. and the U.S. is the biggest oil producer in the world right now. But uh, still, people in the oil field are used to this boom and bust, and at the same time, as we change our economy to one that is based more and more on renewables, and that's based more and more renewables um, at as far as cost as much as anything, I think the um, there are big opportunities in the renewable industry in trying to build a um, the economy of the future. I mean, I, I I have a friend of mine who works in in oil and gas who says, well, I think I think oil may have one more good run left in it, but I'm kind of interested in. Uh, it'd be nice to be on the other side of history. So I think there are many people in oil and that may be a common thing in in uh, in the oil field that the people trying to say I'd like to be on the other uh, on the other side of history if you will gotcha okay one more question about some um oil sands has the evacuation oh no the excavation um of the Ath Athabasca oil sands affected the local climate okay. um two answers to that sort of uh locally and globally Locally, there are, uh, when I was flying over uh, the oil sands, the pilot, this was a genuine bush pilot, uh, big guy who's just, um, he could just barely fit into the cockpit of a Cessna. And, uh, but we were flying over the t a town that was further north from Fort McMurray. Fort McMurray is actually not right next to uh, the oil sands, but there was a uh, the next town called Fort Mackay, and the pilot made a curious comment there. He said, "Boy, just some nasty smells around there. I sure wouldn't want to live there." Uh, the Fort Fort Mackay is a First Nations uh, settlement. Uh, the basically the Aboriginal uh, Canadians. It has uh, pluses and minuses. A lot of the 
uh, oil related equipment, uh, I'm sorry, or oil services industry is very big in Fort Mackay. And the uh, average paycheck in Fort Mackay is actually pretty good. At the same time, there, uh, some days they will say, okay, it smells like rotten eggs, hydrogen sulfide um, is wafting over the town. Um, and, oh, what's, the, uh, there are big, yeah, big hydrogen sulfide emissions and also um, their emissions from the refineries just from uh, petrochemicals. There have not been detailed studies of the uh, issues in Fort Mackay, but anecdotally, um, miscarriages, the people are advised, you know, don't take showers there, use bottled water for your showers. The, uh, so there's been uh, a lot of damage to the Athabasca River, which is the main, the main river there. Um, at the same time, these tailings ponds are, are just massive things. And if they stopped the oil sands tomorrow and the oil companies walked away from these tailings ponds, sooner or later, they're gonna go. And you, have, you will have massive uh, release of these, I mean, just one of these tailings ponds into the Athabasca River and into the Arctic is a big deal. Um, the, on the larger area of um, of global climate, there is a there's an oil sands discovery center, sort of the museum of uh, of Fort McMurray, and they talk of you know on one side they'll say well geez our you know our emissions are insignificant when you look at uh, you know against the uh, global emissions from all sources. And that's convenient because almost any anybody, any oil and gas producer can say that. But at the same time, the oil sands is the third biggest oil deposit in the world after, uh, uh, let's see, after Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. So there, there is a tremendous uh, amount of uh, carbon to be released from oil sands yet to be drilled. Uh, the uh, James Hansen made the memorable statement that the full development of the of the oil sands and you know exotic oil, which I think he was uh, here referring to uh, fracking as well, is game over for climate. So maybe uh, one could say, well, is he pushing it a little bit? Maybe, but this is this is a a whole lot of carbon that is presently underground that will not be underground um, if full development of the oil sands takes place. And I would I would say Keystone XL is one of the major uh, things that will facilitate the development of full development of the oil sands. Uh, just quickly for everyone online, in case they don't understand, what exactly is a tailings pond? Um, Tailings Pond is a uh, basically when you get a, a dump truck load full of uh, of oil sands. To get the oil out, you have to um, shoot hot water into it and hot water and chemicals. And part of that uh, melted tar bitumen uh, floats off, but you're left with um, some very polluted water that has those chemicals, that has uh, dissolved hydrocarbons, polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons, all kinds of good stuff. And, um, and you need a place to put that water so that the, uh, the oil can separate from the water. And that actually can take, um, can take years. So they've created these giant tailings ponds so that this, this settling process uh, can take place, but it just takes uh, a long time and the, the tailings ponds are just, are just massive things. I would say um, just dial up Fort McMurray on Google Maps and then switch to satellite view and you can see them very easily. Great, thank you. 
Okay, we're running uh, about five minutes to one, so we're gonna grab these last two questions. Okay, uh, I know you have a great interest in history. Did you have a chance to explore interesting historical sites other than the Roosevelt National Park on this trip? Um, in a way, I was following uh, in reverse the route of the uh, the opening of the prairie in Saskatchewan. The in the early 1900s, the railroads came kind of marching through the prairie, and the, the road that I the the route that I rode was was right next to the railroad, and you would find these little grain towns and elevators that were right next to the rail lines. One of them was called uh, Maymont, where the the railroad baron who was was building the railroad was uh, was also starting the town, and uh, his daughter was saying, "Oh, could you uh, could you name the the town Montgomery after our was our last name?" And he looked it up and said, "No, there's already uh, a town called Montgomery." But her name was May. She he said, "Okay, so we'll call the town Maymont." Um, but all of these, uh, the little towns on on the on the prairie, are uh, in some ways they're hard by the railroad now, because the uh, the grain elevators have all gotten concentrated in bigger and bigger places, and the uh, the prairie is bought up. By larger and larger operators, you just need fewer people to harvest grain than you did in the 1920s. So there are still some uh, some neat little towns and and some wonderful people that I ran into along the way. But it's it's almost like you're seeing a long term fading of the prairie. Sometimes when I when I hear people say, um, you know the we don't have room in in the U.S. and we don't have room in in Canada for immigrants. You kind of look at some of these towns and say, you know, there's some pretty empty places in the in the U.S. and Canada that uh, you know not necessarily near uh, near the big towns. So that was that was probably one of the uh, one of the the non-historical pieces outside of Teddy. I got as you can see, uh, I got pretty wrapped up with. Uh, uh, with Teddy, not to not to be too much, not to be in the hero worship mode. Um, he had he had his issues, but uh, it, it's almost a, to my mind, he's almost like a distant mirror of uh, what I hope would happen now. Anyway, thank you. We have one last question, and I'll leave it for this. Uh, David, has this particular trip made you more or less hopeful? Um. I think I want this trip was to look at where climate change is coming from. And uh, it is clear that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the oil patch in Alberta is a big thing and it's going to take a while to shut it down. It is going to take a while for it to, um, for it to decline. But I think there are also people kind of shrugging a little bit and saying, well, maybe oil and gas has has uh, uh, has had its run. And that particular feeling is uh, actually pretty optimistic. I mean, these two places that were really the frontier, uh, the industrial frontier of North America, if you if you want, um, in the. 1990s and, and early 2000s are uh, fraying around the edges a good bit. And I actually find that encouraging because it's like, okay, and now we're looking at those giant wind farms that um, and the the advent of, uh, of solar panels. So, um, so we'll see, we'll see. All right, thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. We did record this presentation. If you missed it or had to leave early or if any of your colleagues would like to watch this later, it'll be up on the library's YouTube channel. If we didn't get to your question or uh, didn't mention your personal comment, we will be passing those on to um, 
David after this presentation. Thank you so much, Dave. And it was very, very happy. I mean, I was very happy to have you on here and the library is very happy uh, that you wanted to promote your, promote your book and tell your story. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, it has been a pleasure to be back with NOAA colleagues. Okay, thank you everyone and have a great day.